Well, welcome to another episode of Coronacation. I'm Naomi White in Brisbane, Australia, and today I'm here with Catherine Clark in Brisbane as well. How are you, Catherine? Hi, Naomi. Nice to be with you. You too. Great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So about me, I am a born and bred Queenslander. Uh, occasionally, my travels around the globe mean I've got an accent where people get confused. So to be clear, I'm not a Kiwi. <laughs> my father is Scottish, so sometimes it sounds a bit funny. And my husband is an Englishman from Yorkshire. But I'm born and bred Queenslander, country girl. I'm in the city now. Um, and currently... CEO of Netball Queensland and the Queensland Firebirds. And last year we added another arm to our business, which was Nissan Arena. So I've entered the world of large sporting infrastructure management, which during COVID-19 has been a vertical learning curve. Yes. Um, but look, I've, you know, in terms of my background, I've always been involved in sport as long as I can remember. And I don't really see how that hasn't touched one aspect of my life, whether it's now being a mother of two young boys, three and six, um, but I'm always with that performance sort of mindset. I've loved sport and, and I frequently tell people I will never repay the debt I owe sport for the person it's made me, the values it's instilled, the disciplines um, and the friendships all over the world that um, it has given to me. So I sit currently in the chair with netball, um, but I. Started in hockey, field hockey. If you've got American viewers, then it's field hockey, not ice hockey. Have yeah. watched a lot of ice hockey. Would never play it. Happy to be a fan. Scary sport. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've also was the CEO of Gymnastics Australia through the London Games cycle. Uh, worked in sport and recreation in the government in uh, more of a funding and policy role uh, in New Zealand. Uh, worked for the International Paralympic Committee over in Germany, played hockey professionally in the Netherlands. So I've kind of been everywhere and, and I'm a bit of a, you know, citizen of the globe, um, the global sporting industry. And I started my academic um, journey in law and criminology. So there is no kind of linear pathway here. It's, um, it's a life driven by curiosity. And I think I found my calling around servant leadership and and that's sort of directed me in terms of the leadership roles that I, I currently have. That's and it's I mean. evident you've followed your passion and that's led you down a path of success and you've done great things for female sport um, and netball's never been more popular so uh, yes yeah, so and then COVID-19 came along so tell me how that's impacted you. Yeah it's you know really interesting Nami from a career point of view and I think in you know, definitely there's been some recent um, commentary around CEO roles and how long a CEO role, you know, you should be in there as a leader. So I clocked up five years at Netball Queensland in January. Um, and in one way, I'm like, oh my gosh, how has five years disappeared? You know, I had a child in that time and we've achieved so many things. Um, and I was starting to think, okay, well, I don't want to be one of those leaders that overstays. Um, and I also need to be fresh and have new challenges. And then COVID-19 happened and every bit of skill and knowledge and bit of experience that you've gathered along all of these roles comes into play because it gets tested under mm. pressure. And mm. so there's been um, the scale globally, the speed, the escalation, and I, I think the humanitarian dimension mm. of COVID-19 um, it just jolted you. It's like the world stood still for a moment and you said, okay, this stuff is no longer important. This is important. Safety of yeah. our people, you know. Unlike Queenslanders, you know, we are used to a crisis like a cyclone, a weather event. Um, we've been through many of these rather horrific natural disasters, but this is a crisis of a completely different making and you know, sport, the, the operating model and the business that we're used to running is built on scaled events, putting your fans in stadiums, you know, from coaching courses to the gathering at Downey Park Netball Association on the weekend where there's thousands of young girls and parents and grandparents and coaches and volunteers. 
it all stops, you know, mm. and we ourselves become the risk factor because it's, if we aren't washing our hands, if we haven't got good hygiene protocol, we can infect people, particularly the most vulnerable of our community, um, with really dire consequences if we're not really careful. So I think that um, all of those things that I was worried about, you know, okay, am I going to not have enough to focus on and challenge? Well, that completely went out the window because COVID-19 put everyone in the whole world, every business and every part of your business um, under pressure and you have to completely rethink how it works. And, you know, there's many um, of us who think it, well, we're, we're not going to just go back to our old ways. It's, it's like a once in a generation shift, a catalyst for change that um, horrific, the, the death toll of the pandemic, you know, it, it, um, I'm not going to say I'm unaffected by that. It's just a huge tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, while you're coping with that and your people are coping with that, you've got to be able to make sure that your business continues so that it can employ people, that you can get people back mm -hmm. into jobs and that you can help um, drive the recovery phase. Because if we don't manage the balance of acknowledging um, what's happening in our communities and the impact of this virus, with the fact that we must lead through it. You know, the, the VUCA leadership, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguity, wow. This yeah. has brought all of those skill sets to the fore, I think. And, and our business is no different. Sport literally requires the current business model of sport, scaled people being engaged, either participating, volunteering, or, or watching. And so it's placed our our existing business model under enormous pressure. So that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of uh, pressure on your shoulders. How are you managing through that? We have great people would be the first thing. I have two little boys who every day um, bless me with the perspective, um, you know, with their, they're really clever. Kids are really clever, you know, mm. and I think sometimes we can find ourselves, you know, uh, what you focus on is what you see. Yeah. And kids have an ability to see 360 multicolored rainbows, you know, and unicorns jumping and um, they worry about their grandparents. They worry about their teachers, but they also find magical moments in playing Lego or painting a picture. And if we can be still long enough to enjoy those moments, then there is a silver lining to the disruption. Because without that disruption, um, it's hard to stop sometimes, you know. So I think for me personally, one of the big shifts I had to make was letting go. Mm. I think for athletes who are in a pre-season, you know, we're a professional sporting club. They've had a big pre-season, had a, you know, a really challenging season last year. So there was so much um, excitement, anticipation, expectation hard work preparing for this season and then it stops and there's no certainty around when it will restart or if it will restart you know that's a that's a lot of emotion there the human emotion factor of of a leadership role you you realize that you're actually picking up all of this stuff with employees who you know we had to stand down some staff we had some staff on reduced hours those that were continuing on business critical processes or pivot. We did a pivot project looking at digital transformation. Well, those staff are doing ridiculous hours, you know, and feeling the weight of delivering a recovery mm. for those staff that weren't, um, that were not there at the moment. So, you know, in a geographical distributed way where we're not able to give each other a hug or a high five or, you know, so I think the primary thing for me was to, to realise I had to not fight it. I had to let go of the way things were and completely dedicate myself to the path in front. Um, and from the very beginning, from mid, about 13th of March, when it really came to Australia and to, to our environment, our business, we focused on three pillars where there was loads of uncertainty um, it grounded me and it certainly worked for our organisation, which was let's focus on business continuity, the mm -hmm. here and the now and how we make sure that this organisation, our sport, gets to a strong position for recovery. The pivot project, 
what can we do with what we've got right now and the opportunities that the digital platforms can provide? So a mm. pivot project, giving our staff an opportunity to reskill and, and do some work and work in some spaces that they may have an interest in. And then the third piece being recovery. How do we make sure that we are ready, planned, et cetera, for a recovery, whatever that looks like. Mm. Um, so I think once you let go of kind of managing a global pandemic, which you can't, <laughs> you, can't. Um, you then can dedicate yourself to new habits, new routines. Um, and I think it's the process of not fighting it. Let go. And that way you can focus on creating a whole new thing. And when there's so much power in that, when you can make the transition, mm. but it's, it's really easy to say. Mm. It takes a conscious um, effort to adapt and invent the new and just say, well, that, that's not, we're actually never going to go back that way. Yeah, I think you're right. Or so, we don't want to go back that way because there's, there's actually more opportunity over here. Yeah. No, that's a lovely way of looking at it. So that's great advice. Have you got any other advice for others around the world, things that are working for you through this period that may be beneficial? Yeah, I think that um, one of the, there's a couple, two things that have really struck me. One's around, again, that power of vulnerability, but how important it is from the top. Mm. Um, and the second one is around acknowledging fatigue and, um, again, the role of, you know, visible leaders as well as distributed leaders in your organisation to model that. So I think that, um, you know, the, the, for me, a couple of weeks ago, I had a really rough week, you know what I mean? I was, we have town halls every week. Um, everyone jumps online. Um, that's a big silver lining for this whole process. I've never, ever known so many dimensions of Microsoft 365. <laughs> Parts of that package that I didn't know existed. Um, so I will happily take that as a legacy moving forward that we are now, you know, optimising our use of those kinds of systems. But we were on our team's meeting and I just said to them, like, I've really struggled this week. I feel mm -hmm. like I just want to give people a hug um, and I can't and I, I shouldn't. Um, I'm going through a lot of this. I'm tired. I've, I'm an introvert and, and yet I've never had so many conversations in a compact period of time, seven days a week, where the stakes are so high. Mm -hmm. And I guess what, what it really brought home to me to become... Um, to become very aware of is I and my executive team were making a lot of hard calls with a lot of high stakes. Yeah. So a high volume of really hard decisions where actually any of the options you're looking at wouldn't be one you'd choose, but the stakes are high because if we don't get it right, we've got our business continuity uh, we've got financial risk. We've got health risk. People can die from this. Um, you don't want that on your watch. So over a prolonged period of time, make, you know, those two things hand in hand, that's, that's a lot of fatigue. Mm. And so I was really open with my people. And what was really heartwarming after that, because you do worry, you know, mm. we were taught in the 90s that leadership was about being tough and strong and having the answers and rah, you know. Um, but there's a different kind of leadership which they need to see as well, which is just honest. And the notes that I got from my staff after that and people reaching out and going, I am so glad you said that because that gave them the freedom to talk about where they're at and to care for each other. Um, and I, I realised how powerful that was for, that, for them to hear it from me mm. and to invite them to share with each other. Mm. So I think... We should not underestimate that it, we need to do that. It needs to be heartfelt. It doesn't matter if you cry or if you don't look great. You know, I, I think we just got to be there and be real. Mm. Um, and the second one is fatigue. And I think a lot of people will know my network is struggling with this. Um, there's a bit of survivor guilt, you know, when people are losing jobs or being stood down and, and you know, even in families, um, that you're working really hard. And there's an intensity which I think, you know, is definitely leading to some adrenal fatigue because it's such, again, hard calls and high stakes. 
Mm. So I, um, I really believe that we have got a bit of a energy deficit we're going to hit at some point and that, you know, when we're looking after our people, we need to be factoring in some time out and unplugging. Mm. What is going to make that more complicated is that we've just integrated quite marvellously home and work. And at the one hand, we're marvelling at how we've done it and people are being productive and personally I'm celebrating. I know in our industry we don't do working from home particularly well because sport is about showing up, you mm. know, and putting training together and being there. There is a residual cultural kind of overlay about, well, what are people doing if they're working in their pyjamas and are they really doing the washing or are they taking the dog for a walk? Or um, We've just gotten over that, Nomi. We've, right <laughs> however, people are checking their phones, they're checking their emails, their work is in the, in the room next door. And my next, I guess, challenge I want to focus on is, so in this new way of working, greater flexibility, how do we manage the well-being when the integ integration of work and home is a lot stronger? Mm. What will that look like? Because I think it needs to be ramped up from what it has been previously because the intensity means that we're, we've created new habits. We've got to wind back some of that or create some block out, you know, uninstall work apps from your phone if you're going on leave for a week. I mm. think it might need to be some more um, stronger interventions to unplug. Mm, perhaps encouraging people to set their own boundaries a bit more, that it's okay to set some boundaries around work at home. Absolutely. Mm. And then, so how as an employer, if the workspace is now in the home, um, you know, one of the things we managed really well was that um, decentralisation of our staff. We had a great plan. We'd already done audits of people's environments for going to work at home. So what's the audit then for unplugging? Mm, that's such a great question. <laughs> uh, so we have the self-responsibility, you mm. know, and I think sport in some ways, if we take a leaf out of our elite athletes, you have to be really mindful of what your body's telling you because you yeah. won't perform at your best unless you're really conscious of how am I feeling? Am I sleeping? Am I eating? Well, I reckon we could all take a leaf out of that book. We need to find some time to tune in to what our body is telling us. And as an em then as an employer, we've done the audit physically of desk height, seating. Have you got natural light? Is there a fire escape? There is now, I think, a requirement around this fatigue and the intensity of the work we've been through. There's a mental health component to that is how do we manage that unplugging? Because even some of our staff, they really want to do great Naomi, they want to, to work to make sure our organisation can recover. So often are, are probably blinded to the toll that it's taking on them. Um, and so we've got to do something. Everybody takes practice. You know, but like anybody who's ever been in an executive role would talk to or would, would identify with working through the exhaustion, that there's yeah. almost a badge of honour that you just keep on going. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And how are you? I'm tired. I'm busy. I'm tired. I'm busy. In this new environment, we do have to listen to our bodies. Mm. And, uh, and self-care. I think I need a nap. I think I need to put my phone away. Mm. And I think that's coming. You know, there's, there's definitely more um, literature out there now. And, and I mean, the, the digital um, appetite has been amplified. So there's apps and there's, you know, mm. um, I really like Adriana Huffington's the, the Thrive um, work that she's doing. It's just making that part of normal life rather than seen as when I'm on a health kick, I'll do that. Yes. Actually, self-care on a daily basis, you know, for me, getting my kids to see me and being the role model of that because I'm at home was really, really important then um, because the... There's a great saying that your children will never be less anxious than you are. Mm. That is such a powerful statement for every parent to remember. Your children will never be less anxious than you are. And they might show it differently, 
and they might not always be, you might not see it straight away, but it will be there for them. So that self-care, if we're working at home and we're bringing that into our environment, uh, we need to be really mindful. Self-care needs to become a daily practice. And our children depend on it. Well, Catherine, that's been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for your time. There's so much gold in there. And uh, you're doing an amazing job. And uh, fingers crossed, we're all back on the netball courts uh, sometime soon. Oh, it's coming. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Thank you. Well, you have a great day. Speak soon. Bye-bye.